And so on behalf of Opal, please allow me to welcome you, everybody. It is eight o'clock at Guy's End. And so we, I am extremely honored that you're kind of giving us your time this evening. Guy, before we get started, I'd love to hear about how would you like to handle questions? All right, so I have three slides in the deck that I'm going to use this evening uh, that have a big Q ampersand A. So I'll entertain questions at those points. The third one comes at the very end of the session so we can discuss anything that I've covered to that point or anything that you think I might you know, have something to say. Um, this is just a, a small slice of my methodologies uh, that we're going to cover tonight. So if you have any other questions about, you know, the, the business, uh, the practices, the philosophies, uh, the processes uh, regarding uh, performance-based instruction or training or learning, whatever you need to call it, uh, I'm happy to entertain all of that here. So, and I'm willing to stay late this evening. And of course, this will be recorded. And if you need to leave early, uh, go ahead and you can, you know, catch up the video later on. Thank you so much, Guy. And um, I just want to reassure you that we are all here to learn from Guy's impressive background. So ask your questions. All questions are welcome. We want to be enriched by his expertise and experience. So um, do not hesitate um, to ask, ask your questions. Guy, over to you. All right, well, let me, uh, did you give me sharing screen? Yeah, so. Yeah, the other co-host. Can everybody see that? Not yet. Yes, now we can. Okay, good. All right, so uh, again, I'm Guy Wallace. I want to talk to, about, to you about performance analysis and gap analysis. Um, this is all based on what I started learning my first day out of college back in August of 1979 that was based on the work of Gary A. Rumler, the late Gary uh, Rumler, who um, was instrumental in teaching the people that I went to work with. So I, what they told me is that I was learning a derivative of a derivative of the methodologies of Gary A. Rumler, who is a fairly famous guy in the field um, and was one of my key mentors. Uh, but anyway, so I, I attribute the bulk of what I'm going to cover today to what I learned from him. And of course, I've modified it a little bit. We're going to talk about this graphic that's on the screen here a little bit uh, later, but that is what I've tried to do is capture my mental model for conducting performance analysis. And this is this is what I have in my mind when I'm doing analysis, because you can't drag this stuff, kind of stuff out and do it that way. So first things first, I've been in this business for a long time, and you need to be okay with the fact that you adopt what you can, you adapt the rest, and you may have to reject things. Um, that don't fit your methodology. So as you begin to put together your own approach to doing things or you're, you're learning your organization's approach to doing things, as you continue to learn uh, as a lifelong learner, um, you need to retrofit things into your methodology set. And sometimes the language needs to be changed because you can't call it tasks or steps or activities here, here, and here. You, you need to decide what you're going to call it, you know, and, and adopt the uh, language of the business that you're working with or the clients that you have. But, but so don't be afraid to do that. So what I present is my way of doing things, unless my client says, oh, we don't call it that, we call it something else, and then I'll use whatever they want to call it, because that's the way the real world works. So adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Now, uh, we've already kind of covered this thing, and I wasn't planning on spending much time on it. This slide is important only in, uh, that it's, these are my clients. And I've used the, what I'm gonna talk to you about in almost each and every project that I've done for this group of clients, which is a whole bunch of industries. 
And I was thinking about this earlier and I thought, what industry is not represented in my client list? Well, maybe agriculture is not. Um, but but so I've I've had great success with this. And I think this is kind of a universal approach. But again, feel free to not adopt, but adapt it as you find necessary. Now, this is one of the handouts uh, that was made available to you. This is chapter 11 in the third edition of the Handbook of Human Performance Technology. Why do we call it human performance technology? Well, because all performance is a human endeavor. This has been a controversy since 1979 as to what do we call this stuff. And why do we call it human performance technology instead of what ATD used to be known as ASTD? Well, they call it human performance improvement. Well, yeah, that's so human performance technology is the means to the ends of human performance improvement. And the word technology means the application of science. It doesn't mean digital and computer stuff. It means the application of science. And so the science of human performance improvement is what this is all about. And this is how I grew up in the organization that was known as NSPI, the National Society for Programmed Instruction, and then Performance and Improvement, and then uh, or performance and instruction, and then it was settled on being known as the International Society for Performance Improvement, ISPI. But that was my professional home since uh, September of 1979, one month after I got out of college and joined this field. All right, so uh, this is my mentor here. This is 1982 at Motorola in our offices in, in Phoenix. I was headquartered in Chicago. Gary Rummler was from New Jersey back then. And here we are sitting around talking about a project in my boss's office because he was in Phoenix and I was in Chicago. But anyway, that's the guy. He's the guy. He's the man. So I owe everything to him. So my pattern when I design training is includes information, demonstration, and application or practice with feedback. And uh, we deploy things generally in that sequence, but when we do design and when we do development, we do it backwards. So if you've heard about backward chaining, this is the model. I was taught, guy, the first thing you do is you develop the test. First, you, you create the objectives, performance-based learning objectives, because we want to teach people how to perform. They are not here just to learn stuff. They need to learn how to perform to some level so they can go back to the job with the competence and confidence that they need. But we always start with the application. So the final application is, could be the test. Um, and then if a demonstration is required because the audience doesn't has never seen this before, live or in action, then we may wanna do a demonstration. And then we can figure out, well, what information, what's the minimal amount of information we would give people so that the demonstration makes sense? And if we do that right, that demonstration is really going to look like an application exercise, a practice exercise. We're going to show them in the demo what we expect them to do in the APO. So info, demo, APO. And that's how I've uh, structured this session. You're going to be getting ready to do an APO. So you are warned in advance that that's what I expect. So here's my mental model. Let me start on the left here with, it's all about the process. Performance, it, it process is just another word for performance or workflow, work processes, work streams, a whole bunch of different language for the same thing. So if you need to call it workflow, that's fine. That's your part of your adaptation. But so there's upstream stuff, which produce in outputs, which become inputs to the green box there, the processes. And our processes produce outputs which are then inputs downstream further. And so that's part of the mental model is understanding things from a process orientation. The late uh, W. Edwards Deming, a quality guru, talked uh, has a famous quote that says, if you don't know what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. So I've been given this process orientation since I first got into the business. Now, the spine there, the fishbone part of this, if you'll see at the very bottom that says adapted from the Ishikawa diagram, which was from the quality movement in Japan in the 1950s, as they were trying to improve post-World War II quality of Japanese products and such. 
This is also kind of a meld of the Gilbert behavior engineering model, which you should all learn about at some point in your uh, in your learnings. And then the Rumler and Breathauer general systems model. So there's that Rumler name again. Yeah, that's the guy, that's the man. So anyway, that, that humans bring enablers to the process. They bring what they know, their knowledge and skills, awareness, knowledge and skills. They bring their physical attributes, psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and personal values. And either what the humans bring to the performance process party is sufficient or it's not. And so gaps in the process and how the process operates to produce outputs could be due to deficits, deficiencies in what the human enablers need to be. But also what's really important is are the environmental enablers, data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount, and then culture and consequence. So one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rummer back in 1981 when I was working at Motorola and he was one of the consultants that I got a chance to work with after learning in the first job before that, his methodologies, my second job at Motorola, I got to work with the guy. So that was, you know, way cool. Um, but anyway, so he would say that the first thing he does when he looks at performance and if there's a gap and a problem or an opportunity, the first thing he looks at is the process. Is there one? If there is, is it being adhered to? If not, why not? And so, so his experience told him that most of the time, performance problems are due to the process itself. It's a lousy process or people, you got one, but people don't adhere to it. So that's a different issue. He said the second thing that he would always look at is the consequence system. Are people being rewarded for doing poor work? You know, uh, have we, or as the consequence system such that we give our best performer more work than anybody else. And eventually they smarten up and they start slacking off. And that's why performance has degraded perhaps. And so it could be the consequence system or are we having safety issues? People are violating the safety policies and procedures because maybe the supervisor is pushing them to get done, get done, get done. And so the consequence system there may be what's really driving the, perf the performance problem. Now, I'm a learning and development kind of guy. We used to call ourselves training people, instructional designers or instructional systems designers. But I use this model here because I'm trying to help my clients um, determine whether or not the project that I'm working on for learning and development should be continued or stopped. I've got to generate analysis data to help them get to what I call the L&D pivot point. Now, this is my book from 2023, um, and I'll, I'll show that model on the book there, but it's just as important to help our clients understand where training or instruction or learning isn't what we should be doing as it is to do it well when it should be something that we're attending to. It may not be the sole item in the solution set. It may need other improvements to these other variables, these enablers, and maybe knowledge and skills needs to be addressed through, through a learning experience, or my default would always be what was called guidance back in 1970. And when I got in the business in 79, it was more popularly known as job aids. And then it was electronic performance support systems. And now it's generally performance support. Um, so there's a whole bunch of names that we have to contend with, labels that, that uh, overlap and have changed over the years. But um, one of the things that I learned was that let's give people a job aid and guide their performance that way, rather than trying to force people to memorize things that are basically impossible to memorize or to keep in memory without space learning or whatever we might need to use. So let me go on to this. This is my adaptation of the ADDIE model. It starts with project planning and kickoff, then it goes into analysis, then design, then development or acquisition, because sometimes you, you develop things or you buy things, build or buy. 
And I've extracted the pilot testing out of most people's model when they think of the in the development phase, they're doing all sorts of testing to make sure things are good before they release it uh, to impl implement it and evaluate it in the traditional ADDIE model sense. But I pulled out pilot testing because I always wanted to make a big deal as a consultant to my clients that, hey, we're getting ready. We're doing everything to get to that pilot test where we're going to try to do a full destructive pilot test on our instruction or training or learning. And clients would say, why do we want to do that? I'd say, don't you want to break it early as soon as possible? If it is can be broken, shouldn't we break it first and fix it before we release it to the learners? The target audiences. So that's the concept there. So per doing performance and gap analysis happens right there in the analysis phase. And I'm ge getting ready to review that. That's an upside down stoplight, which means it's a go light. It's what the quality movement would call a gate review meeting. So we conduct our analysis and we go to this review meeting with the client and stakeholders and review the data that we've got and get it sanctioned or approved or amended or rejected uh, before we go on to the design phase because we want to make sure that we're working with the right stuff. We want to understand uh, that analysis data. And so that, that gate review meeting there is where I would uh, take my analysis data and review it with the clients. There's a lot of controversy in our field. This has been true since <laughs> the early 80s. Don't be an order taker. Well, the late Joe Harless at a conference said to the audience, uh, 1,200 people, I think it was there at the time, uh, he said, uh, and when your client comes to you and asks you if you can help them with some training, don't say in your whiniest voice, are you sure it's a training problem? He was a jokester. So he said, of course, you take the order, but in my words nowadays, I would say, make sure that your order fulfillment process includes an adequate analysis effort. If you're in an enterprise, an organization, and you've got the learning and development function, you are a support organization. Who are you to tell somebody that, no, you're not gonna do their project unless it doesn't meet whatever criteria might be established. But as a support organization, we are to take our clients' issues and needs and help them figure out how to fix it. And if learning, instruction, training, has got nothing to do with what's wrong, then we should help them understand that so they can make the appropriate fixes to the other variables of performance. So that's what this is all about. Regardless of how you generate this analysis data, it's really all about the data's validity and credibility. Now I've had, back at Motorola, I had uh, I distributed 20 binders of the analysis report for a project. And the head person uh, of the manufacturing managers at, all across Motorola, he took one look at the front page where I had put all the names of the contributors and he saw a few names on there that he didn't like and he threw the binder across the room. It was very dramatic. Um, and I learned something about, oh, you know, I, sh I shouldn't have... Uh, been forced to go dig up these subject matter experts on my own. You guys should have told me who I should have gone to. So the data needs to be accurate, complete, and appropriate. And the trick is to have your clients and stakeholders handpick all of your sources for interviews, where should you go observe things, and where not to go, and what documents should I review, and what documents might I not review. So get guided by your clients and stakeholders for the success of your projects, because otherwise you might have valid data, but it may lack credibility just because of your sources. Now, I do four types of standard analysis in all of my projects. I look at the target audience, I look at the performance, what, the, what are they supposed to be doing? Then we look at the, we do a knowledge and skill analysis. What do they need to know to be able to do? And then I look at the existing content that they may have. There may be training materials, there may be sales brochures, there may be a whole bunch of other ancillary kinds of content that I can use as part of the learning experience. Because if that's what's available out there in the real world for the job, 
then I should use that and not try to recreate it because then that just means there's two things to update when things go out of date. Interesting point about the target audience analysis is that I can start it before I do any of the other types of analyses, but I cannot finish it until I finish the performance analysis and knowledge and skill analysis. Because I can figure out, well, who is the target audience? What are their job titles? But until I have the performance nailed down, I can't ask the question, is everybody in the target audience responsible for that performance or just some of them? But I learned a long time ago, just because people have the same job title does not mean that they have the same job assignments. So, and the other next part is the knowledge and skills. If I understand the performance and what knowledge and skills are required in order to be able to perform, do some people come into the job already knowing some of that from prior education or experience? So only once I've defined the performance and the knowledge and skills, can I really finish my target audience analysis to decide that, oh, maybe 25% of the people already know everything that they need to know to be able to do this. And maybe only 50% of the people with that job title actually have to produce those outputs that we're gonna talk about. So those are my four types of analysis. And our focus this evening is on what I call performance analysis. You might end up calling it something else as you adapt what I'm sharing with you. So I call this this device here on the screen, the performance model. Now in the old days, it used to be called a job model. And Joe Harless, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, he, he was a big promoter of job modeling and job models. And he asked me at a conference one time why I changed the name from job model to performance model. And it was because I told him that it's because when I do analyses, I'm often looking at more than one job. So I'm looking at jobs and I didn't want to call it jobs model. So I called it performance model. And I borrowed the, that kind of language from his good buddy, Gary Rumler. They were competitors, but they were good buddies. Uh, but anyway, this is the, the, the data capture device. So if I'm meeting with a group and if I'm not doing this through individual interviews or observations and document reviews, I'm assembling a team of what I call master performers and other subject matter experts and perhaps supervisors and perhaps new hires, people who are recently new to the job, who have learned the job, because if I'm dealing with a bunch of master performers or top performers or whatever you need to call them, experts in performance, I they may not understand or appreciate what it's like to be a new person coming into the job and having been responsible for this performance. But anyway, so that's that's what I look, uh, this is the device that I look at now. So the, the first thing here is you can see that I've highlighted this area that I call areas of performance. So if I was to be looking at some sizable chunk of performance, I may need to break it out into what I call areas of performance. Other people might call them major duties or accomplishments or key results areas. Again, it's one of these language issues that we have and that we'd have no standard language across the profession. I'm sorry if that's bothersome to you. You're gonna have, that's part of the learning and performance curve you have to climb is figuring out all this language differences here that we've got. But I call it area performance because when people talked about major duties, they it usually had a nuanced meaning and it was not conducive to what I needed to do. So I created my own label for it. So I'm one of the guilty people who's created all this uh, overlapping language and such. So if you think of the ADDI model or my own uh, six phase process that I showed you a minute ago, those chunks, those blue boxes are areas of performance. Analysis is one, design is another, development is another one. So when I'm studying some other job, I I need to chunk out their performance. It's a big scope. If it's a narrow scope, then, then sometimes that's not necessary and I can just skip to the next thing. But so that's kind of key to the whole thing is chunking out the performance and then identifying, so what's produced? When people are doing that chunk of performance, if, I mean, guy, if you're doing analysis, what do you produce? Uh, analysis data? Yeah, or something like that. And so we can identify, well, what are the products produced or the services rendered 
because that's what that chunk of performance is all about, is producing that kind of stuff. And then you can ask questions about, well, how are they measured? And what are the standards? You know, is it quality, quantity, cost, or good, better, or bet? Um, so what? So how do you know a good one? So we're, we're one uh, pin down what is produced. Now, there's two types of outputs. There's tangible outputs, I would tell people that I've trained. They're physical, they're kickable. You know, you produce a report, we can go pick it up and, and look at it or look at it on screen. Um, but there's also intangible outputs, uh, cognitive outputs, if you will, thinking outputs. I made a decision and it doesn't show up. You can't kick it, but it was part of the process. So that's just something to be aware of, that there's two types of outputs, uh, physical, kickable outputs, tangible outputs, and there's also the intangible outputs, which are important. Um, so once we understand the outputs and measures, then I would identify the tasks. So here's where our traditional task analysis goes. And of course, it's not as always as simple. It's There are two types of tasks. There are behavioral tasks the overt tasks that we can observe, we can measure them, we can count them. But then there's also those cognitive tasks, the thinking tasks that we can't see. What was Guy thinking while he was doing those behavioral tasks? Um, and it's my premise that um, cognitive tasks happen before, during, and after the behavioral tasks. If you see me doing something, I was probably thinking about it before I really started doing it. And I'm thinking about it while I'm doing it. And I'm thinking about it when I'm done to make sure, did I really get that right? Is it time to move on? Do I need to go back and rework anything? So those are the trickiest parts of analysis is getting those cognitive tasks out. The research shows that experts can share with you 30% of what a novice needs in terms of the cognitive tasks. They've automated those tasks. They're non-conscious knowledge. They're not accessible to the expert that you're talking to. The good news is every expert has automated a different 30%. So instead of missing 70%, if you talk to more than one source, you'll be able to kind of backfill and get closer to 100% in terms of what's the thinking that is necessary behind the doing of those uh, behavioral tasks, the things that we can see. So you might get a list of, uh, you know, 10 tasks, 20 tasks, 100 tasks that go with the output, depending on how granular you get that task information. Then I want to know, so regarding these tasks, who's doing what? What are the various roles? Is there the individual contributor? Is there some other job title that's involved? Some expert from regulatory affairs? Is my manager involved? Is my boss's boss involved? You know, who are the players in the sandbox of performance? Can we have some role clarity? What are they responsible for? You can see at the bottom of the chart there, I've got responsibilities, E-S-I-R-A. And I'm only reading this stuff because I think some of you might have small screens and you can't read it. E is execute the task. The joke is, if it fails, that's who we execute. Ha ha ha, not politically correct. But so that's the E is the person doing the task. There's other people that might be involved that support task execution. They're not responsible for it, but they are there to help. There's other people that simply provide input. And there's other people that provide review, and they provide feedback, but they can't approve or reject. So, and then there's people who actually have the approval rejection, and they can say, guy, I reject this, go back and do it again. Don't like it, go back to Rework City and redo it. So these are the people that are involved with performance. And so if we're training an individual contributor to do something, they need to know who else is involved. What are they supposed to be doing? So that we, they, part of what they need to learn is who does what, what's my role in all of this? Um, because process often isn't something that, you know, one person does all by themselves. Now, of course, there are jobs where there are things where people are doing things all by themselves, but most work is a collaborative process and involves many different job titles or levels, if you will. And so that's one of the things we're trying to clarify. That data 
I call the ideal performance. If I'm dealing with a bunch of master performers and capturing that data, and I've got top performers and they argue it out and we they, we all come to consensus on what's the output, how is it measured, what are the tasks, who's doing what, that's ideal performance. That's what we would want to train or instruct other people on how to do it so they can perform at a level of mastery. But we also want to be look at, well, what are the typical performance gaps? Because learners need to know what's difficult or tricky. What are the gaps? Maybe I do an output and meets all the quality measures, but it's always late. If that was a typical gap that it's always late, we're going to want to know, well, why? So that maybe we can do something about it. Well, so what's the probable gap cause? Now, I'm not calling it root cause analysis. If I had all the time in the world, I might call it that. But I'm just trying to get from the master performers and other subject matter experts, what are the causes for these typical performance gaps? And I'm talking about typical performance ga gaps, not atypical, not once every 32 blue moons. Not it happened back in 43, hasn't happened since, but it was a big one. No, we want to know what's typical because we're preparing people to go perform and they need to know what might they typically run into? What are the barriers to performance and how can they navigate around those barriers or right through them? Um, and the last part of this then is that final column and it, it helps me identify regarding that probable gap cause was that a deficiency of the process or deficiency of the environment or deficiency of the knowledge and skills of the performers or deficiency of the individual attributes and values? Because I'm trying to help my clients see that sometimes the gap is not due to a deficiency of knowledge and skills. So if we throw some training, some instruction, some learning at it, it ain't going to fix it. And so this was my sneaky trick in terms of all the performance and the gap analysis on one page. The client can look at this kind of data and decide whether they believe it or not. And I've had a lot of projects that got stopped because what we found after doing this analysis was that training, instruction, learning wasn't going to solve any of it. There were other variables, performance variables, those enablers that were at the root of the of the gap. And so we helped our clients avoid doing learning when it wasn't going to have any impact, when it would simply have a negative ROI. Clients are appreciative of that most of the time. Here's an example. This is from work that I did back in 1986 with the sales organization. I've changed some of the language here. So the, this area of performance is territory planning. Before you go out in the territory and try to sell things, let's do some territory planning so that you're not going from this state to that state, back to the first state, now to a third state, back to the first state. Let's plan out your territory so that it makes sense. That was the issue for this client. So what the output was, was a territory plan. It needed to be accurate and complete, and it needed to include various things like a territory map, a customer matrix, a prospect matrix, et cetera. So all the experts that I was working with, the master performers and other subject matter experts, all agreed, yeah, that territory plan, that's what we're supposed to produce here. And so then we listed the tasks, and then we decided who does what. And here's an example where there's X's. You can see down in the bottom left, it says sales rep, sales support, sales manager, sales VP. Well, in this chunk of the performance, territory planning, the sales rep and the sales managers are the only one that are involved. And this is how, who's responsible for those tasks. And that's the ideal performance. Then we can look at, well, so if that's ideal, what's real? What are their current state gaps and what are they? And so that's what we came up with. Well, the plan is incomplete or not updated quarterly or when needed. Well, some of the reasons for that was they don't know how. Ah, deficiency of knowledge. They don't take the time. Hmm, maybe they don't have the time to take to do it. So that's a deficiency of the environment. Oh, it's not even demanded by their managers. Well, that's a different type of DE, a deficiency of the environment. 
So this is very eye-opening to my clients because they realize that, well, training wasn't going to fix everything because why train people if the managers aren't even going to ask for it? Only the people back at headquarters wanted that. So that was the gap performance. So this mental model that I've tried to capture here is how I think about things when I'm asking the questions to generate the data so that I get valid data and I'm using the sources that my clients pointed me to so that it's credible. And sometimes I'm using groups in the facilitated group process to generate that kind of data. Sometimes I'm doing it because I'm making a bunch of phone calls or interviews with people face to face or I'm reviewing documents, or I'm doing what the quality movement calls a Gemba walk. I go out there and actually watch people doing this performance and then interview people afterwards and not interrupt them unless that's okay. Um, but this is what, how, what I'm looking for. This is how I'm dissecting performance using this fishbone diagram. Ideal performance is looking at the inputs, the processes, and the outputs. And the gap performance generally focuses on those things on the fishbone itself, but also the process. Because the late Gary Rummler said, start there. Usually, there ain't no process, or there's too many processes, or it's a lousy process, and experts have figured out to ignore the standard company process. They do something else, because the process is stupid, as we used to say back in the day. These are the questions when I train people, these are the questions that I share with them. But I tell them, these are guys' questions. When we do the exercise, you cannot use my questions. But you can use my questions to come up with your own questions. Now, the reason I do that is because if you only have one way to ask a question for the errors of performance or to tease out what are the outputs or what are the measures, and it doesn't resonate with who you're asking, you can't be stymied. You've got to have another way to ask those questions. So I would tell people, when you get in the real world, you can use my questions, but you should have your own set as well. So when we do the practice exercise, we won't do that tonight. You need to come up with different questions. If you ask my question, I'm going to stop you in the middle of the exercise and say, please ask that a different way. Because we've got to be uh, quick on our feet. And if our, we ask a question and people give us a look like they don't know what we're talking about, we have to be able to ask a different, a different way. Our language is not conducive, perhaps, to the master performers and other subject matter experts. And we're trying to generate this data. If they want, didn't want to call it areas of performance, they wanted to call it areas of process, then that's what we would call it. If they didn't want to call it outputs produced, they want to call it deliverables, then that's what we would call it. So our language is really tricky here uh, when we're do conducting our analyses. So these questions here relate to the uh, ideal performance, which is generally around the what's circled there in red. And this next page then, part two, is about the gap analysis. And that focuses on, in on the typical performance gaps, the probable gap causes, and is that gap cause a DP, a DE, a DK, or a DI? So what questions might you have for me? Dylan, uh, we have a fantastic question from Dylan. Dylan, would you like to um, read out your question or would you like me to read out? I can read it. Awesome. Thank you. Do we want, do we want people to perform at mastery, like you said, just because the master performers can? Um, for example, like quality standpoint, you know, even though we can get to 99% perfect, customers only paying for 90%, would we lower our expectations? Well, yeah, so we might. So, you know, what you're, it's like Six Sigma, where you only fail four out of a million opportunities to fail, you only fail four times. So is performance required that? No, we want to know what's possible. 
if it may take a it may take years for somebody to be trained and then become a master performer at the level of the people that we are talking to. We just want to know what's possible. We don't want some reach goal that's actually impossible. Nobody's ever done it, but that's what the that's what the expectation of management is. So we use master performers to help us understand what's really getting done. Because that's the top end of where we can get everybody else. So maybe Guy is out there performing at 50% of what a master performer is. Well, Gilbert called it the PIP, the performance mm-hmm. improvement potential. How, what, what, Where can we possibly get Guy? Now, maybe Guy's got limitations in his psychological attributes or his physical attributes or his intellectual attributes and can never achieve that level of mastery. But if we can improve guys' performance, well, that's what we should be trying for. So I think it's just a, it's just a benchmark of what is possible. Um, and again, if the client isn't willing to pay for something, well, then you shouldn't go to that extent here. You would use you know, a cheaper resource that's not as good as the best person that you've got on the payroll or whatever. Uh, does that answer it? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Guy, other- uh, Guy, what Dylan's question also made me think is what if you do strive for that 95% or that 99% and show the client that it can be done and then bump up your costs? Well, so you're re- redefining the space, perhaps. Is that well, a line of thinking that we can entertain? Well, yeah. So if, uh, but, but, th- but that's getting people to be better, faster, and cheaper. Which, you know, so if I if people were all performing at a level of mastery, that should be less expensive, less rework, greater yield, um, you know, should be cheaper to perform when everybody's at the level of mastery. But if guy is making mistakes and has to redo step three all the time and we can somehow get him uh, to learn how to do step three without having to do rework on step three. We're, we're, we're shortening the cycle times, we're reducing our costs. And so that's, that's all good. But um, so one, some of my experience is that uh, a, a lot of organizations have, uh, um, oh, what's the acronym here? It's the uh, KPIs, um, Key Process Indicators. And when I have dealt with that with master performers in the room, they would tell me that that's all baloney. Some group got together at headquarters and it was a committee and they came to some consensus that this was it. That's not real. So they can be good. KPIs can be good. But often the way that they're created is um, uh, not really a valid approach here because focusing on performance and fi- figuring out really what are people doing. You know, most performance is not measured. And so you get together a bunch of master performers. And I can tell you pretty much for a fact, master performers know how things are measured. They don't allow themselves to miss a measure. They have figured it out informally, most likely. And so what we're trying to do is trap their informal <laughs> learnings and package that so we can get Guy to come up the learning curve and the performance curve quicker mm-hmm. um, so that he can be more like them. Um, so when we folk, but so I, so we, I always want to look at the top performers. I don't want to look at the average performers. I don't want to look at the poor performers. I want to know what's possible. And later on, we can figure out how do we, you know, where is everybody else if that's really critical. But if we understand what master performance looks like, how you measure it, what you got to know to be able to do mastery performance, well, then we can work at, at getting people to begin to climb that learning curve. You know, people don't learn and get mastery in some learning experience. They basically learn things and they go out on the job and there's nuances that weren't covered in the instruction. And so they're figuring, you know, you're always figuring things out. You're always learning as you're doing these kinds of things, ideally. And and so we're, we're just trying to get people ready to get back out on the job and actually perform and learn from doing that and and sharpen their their skills out there on the job site, but we don't want to send them out there with, you know, uh, inadequate instruction or learning. 
um, on this topic or that topic and this topic and that topic, which may be valid topics, but we've not, we don't teach them how to apply those topics in their workflow, in their work processes. Any other questions? I have a question. When you presented uh, the Ishikawa diagram, the fishbone diagram, um, I was just wondering through your various clients and projects, are there a combination of factors, maybe the psychological attribute, culture and consequences, whatever, that have stopped you from taking on that project? Uh, no, because I'll go, you know, I'm, I'm stupid that way. I'll take on any project and get my client to the L&D pivot point where we can use leverage the expertise of their people mm -hmm. to figure out what's possible ideally and where is everybody else falling short? Where are those probable gaps um, and what are the causes for those things and help my client make the business decision of where to make the investment to continue with learning or to pivot to some non-learning in intervention or to do both. Sometimes you go fix the process and then you've got to revamp the instruction and, and tell people learn the new process. Maybe you need to replace the tools and the, uh, revamp the process, replace the data and the tools that people use, whether those are digital tools or sharper saws. Um, but that's the goal. Our, my goal is to help my clients improve performance. Learning may be the means to help get there. And if not, then let's figure that out as quickly as possible. But sometimes when I've, I, when we come up with uh, deficiencies that are basically go back to psychological attributes, well, that's a reflection of the recruiting and selection system. They're recruiting the wrong people. They're recruiting square pegs and pounding them into round holes. And that's no good. That doesn't work very well. Um, so it, sometimes it can work out. Sometimes the square peg can become a round peg and fit better. But But basically we should understand how we in learning work with the recruiting and selection systems and how we do performance measurement and how we do rewards and compensation based looking at a similar set of data that says, this is what we want, this ideal performance. What do people got to know? What, you know, do we need systems thinkers down here? Do we need, or people who can think abstractly and or, or concretely or both? You know, how many switch hitters do we have in, in that can do the concrete thinking and the abstract thinking in the same person? Sometimes we need to divide, redesign the jobs because so we can better fit the people that we have available to us to as performers. Thank you, Guy. We have a question from Brian. Hey, Guy. Um, to go into a little bit more, would you be able to expand a little bit more uh, when you get to the L&D pivot point? on how you approach working with the customer in terms of either so like selecting that intervention. Um, you know, do you, do you do like any matrix and have them do like a survey to, you know, a rating scale? Do you just kind of pre present like either like, I don't know if you've heard of S bars, like a quick summary of here are the options and the pros and cons to them. Um, just trying to think of like when, when did you actually, when did you have a good mastery performance of that and when didn't you and kind of what was the difference? Yeah, can I defer that till later on at the end? Absolutely. Of the because, yeah, 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 yeah that's, just... So, so that's a that's the pivot point, and that's a gate review meeting. And how do you get the clients organized and project steering teams? And what do you do at that gate review meeting? And and the short answer is, how would you display your information? However, they are used to seeing it. You don't force new things on. If they like looking at charts a certain different way, if they want to do calculations of ROI a certain way, you use what the organization uses. You adapt yourself to the organization. If they don't have anything, then you bring in your stuff. But um, um, that's a mistake we often make is that we want to present it the way we like to look at it. And we're, <laughs> we've not figured out how they already look at it. If there's a quality organization and they're showing these X bar R charts and things like that to look at performance. And that's what we should be using as well. We shouldn't force our clients to learn about the learning business because they don't have time for that. Anyway, let make sure we come back to that uh, later on. All right, the demo. So I have a radio TV film degree from 1979, the University of Kansas. And I was, so I went into the first job 
And instead of putting me into the video department, they put me into program development. It was just like being in the military all over again. You know, you come in with a skill set, they go, oh, we could do that, but we won't. We'll put you someplace else. So I worked doing program development, which meant I went out and interviewed uh, master performers and managers and blah, blah, blah. And we came back and we created interview guides to start with. Then we did interviewing and created interview data. And then that got us ready to go into the script writing phase. And after that, we'd actually go plan a video shoot and then do the video editing and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so this area of performance is script writing. And I always like to start with, well, what's the final output? How do you know you're done with script writing? I mean, yeah, there's a whole bunch of steps. You do this, you do that. You do that. But how do we know that we're done? Well, guy, we produce a final script. And the measures of it are quality, quantity, and cost, or better, faster, cheaper, or whatever the specifics are. So this is just a quick demo here. So it's the final script. Okay, so are there any outputs that we produce before we get to the final script? And the answer is, yeah, we, get, we have to have a draft script. Hopefully only one, but usually we have seven. Uh, and we get caught in a rework cycle and blah, 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 before we can break free and have a final script. And before we do that first script, we create what we call a script treatment. One page, no longer, no, no longer, no shorter. One page that describes to the client, well, this is going to be an outdoor setting. It's going to be snowing. There's going to be three people. One of them is going to be this kind of a job. The other people are going to be doing this. They're going to have this dialogue, blah, blah, blah. In one page, this is what we intend to write a script about. And so it gives everybody a clue as to what we're thinking about so that we don't write a big script, go through all of that, review with the client. It's not at all what they wanted or were expecting. So before that, or before that would be the interview data where we talked to the client, we talked to the experts, we came back, we wrote a script treatment up. Maybe they liked it, maybe they didn't. We then went in and drafted a script and did a and created the final. So I would, these are the tasks. I'm just making this stuff real quickly here. Remember, this is going to be similar to the exercise I'm going to give you in just a little bit. So just big, broad tasks, review the interview notes, create the script treatment, get the client approval, draft the script, review it, update it, get the client final sign off. Who's doing what? Well, I've got two roles here in the bottom there. See the roles, client and script writer. So we can just put X's in there and go, okay, who's, Who's involved in the review of the interview notes? Maybe I have the client and the script writer doing these things together. And I can also change those and use those responsibility codes, the E-S-I-R-A. Now there's, there's other different coding that you can use. And again, this is guys coding, but the, there's RACI. Uh, and I can't even tell you what all the what the acronym stands for off the top of my head. I forget it. But I've dealt with clients before where they used RACI. So we used RACI. I've also had clients that used RACI and said, we never understood the difference between the responsibility and the authority, if that's what the RNA stand for. And so they said, guy, we would prefer using yours. Okay, then we'll use mine. But so you default to using the client's way of coding things, the language that they use, you never. I learned this early on. We used to speak in this strange language where it was noun, verb, or verb, noun. Reports generated. Nobody talks like that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I gave up on all of that stuff, and I was at a conference reviewing some of the data that I produced, and people were on me because I wasn't using the right phrasing of the, my, when I was capturing this data and I and I pushed back on them because I said, none of my clients talks like that. Reports generated, reports reviewed. You know, that's, that's shorthand talk. That's training talk, as we used to joke. And we needed to speak in the language of our customers. So however, my, what I would tell clients when I'm gathering this kind of data on flip chart easels or whatever, I would say, whoever says the answers my question first, that's what I write down. I'll write it down just as they said it. I don't edit it. I don't change the phrasing, the wording. I don't move things around. I capture it pretty much verbatim. And then I turn to everybody to see if they agree with what I captured. But anyway, so this is just an example of the uh, ideal performance. Now, what was typical in my world back in the 1979-80 period was that treatments weren't done by some of my peers. Why? 
Well, because the client thought it was a wasted step and they directed us to just skip that. So that's a DE. That's my environment that I'm in. And the client says to skip it. And my environment is telling me to skip it. And so we would skip it. And then we wouldn't do a treatment. We'd spend all of our time and energy drafting a huge script. And then the client would say, well, wait a minute. I wanted this to be outdoors in a winter scene with snow. You've got it inside the store. Rewrite the whole thing. So anyway, so that was why we, you'd want to do a treatment. But the clients often didn't see that was of any value. And if my organization doesn't insist on it, it's really a DI if I, they might expect, well, guy, you should push back on the client. Well, wait a minute. If you're not going to back me, why am I going to push back on the client and insist that we do a treatment? Because if you're not going to support me and you're going to leave me hanging there and, and upset the client and I've got to work with the client and for, you know, so that's just uh, <clears throat> as Deming would say, it's the system. Um so we would have to decide whether that's a DE or a DI. You know, uh, we expect guy to push back when the client insists that we don't do it and have an argument with the client and win. Just do a treatment anyway, guy. You know, so this is where you get into some of the issues that you'd uncover conducting these kinds of analyses and you, you'd be the bearer of the bad news. You'd be the messenger that gets killed because you brought back this is what's really going on when sometimes people don't want to hear it. So that's looking at the process. That's looking at uh, when you're looking at the probable gap cause. Is it a D, P, E, K, or I? That's when you've got this mental model. Again, that's my mental model. You can adopt it. You can adapt it. The Ishikawa diagram was much simpler than this. It said there's a process box and there's men, materials, methods, and machines. That was the Ishikawa diagram from the 1950s. Not very politically correct with the men word in there, but but that's what it was back in Japan, back in those days. And that's what I saw at Motorola when I was there in 81. Next set of questions. Guy. Stunned silence, huh? I have one. Go ahead. And I know I've heard your response, but I would appreciate it if you could help me understand this. Um, when I was being trained, one of my trainings was that the client is not always right, that sometimes they don't understand what the problems are, and that you as an objective person coming from the outside in um, may see something that the client can't see. Um, what's, what are your thoughts, reactions to that? Well, this is a real world issue. And so my experience just kind of ties to the, uh, Brian's question, I believe here about, uh, when you get to the pivot point. So the projects that I had that were absolute failures was when my client decided they didn't want to form a project steering committee of themselves and their internal clients, the stakeholders, mm. the people in the management chain above the target audience. I would try to convince them to assemble a project steering team. We'll review the project plan with them. We'll do the analysis. We'll review the analysis data with them. We'll do a design. We'll review the design with them. We'll develop the content and pilot test it, and we'll show them the pilot results. And the whole time I'd be worried about transfer out loud with them because I said, you know, that you guys on the project steering team, you own the target audience. You can make transfer happen. I can't. You know, you expect us in learning to, to make sure the transfer happens, but it's <laughs> we can't stop a, your supervisors from saying, Guy, you're doing it the newfangled way. You must have learned that in training. Don't do it that way. Do it the old way because I can manage that. I understand that as the supervisor, but you want to do something new and different here and I don't understand it. So stop. And so all the trading was for naught. So the whole client isn't always right. What I found is that when I've been successful and, and this is probably, I'm going to guess 75% of the time, I've gotten the client to form a steering, a project steering team, a PST. These are concepts I borrowed from the quality movement. And we'll conduct these gate review meetings at the end of our phases. If you remember my diagram before, I had the upside down traffic light, the go light instead of a stop light. 
That's the gate. They tell me whether I'm ready to move on to the next phase. They're looking at the data that I'm going to use in the next phase, and they're approving it or amending it, whatever they feel they need to do. Um, so when, but clients sometimes have an idea, and if I don't have the stakeholder group there to hear that idea, question it, challenge it, reject it, and do something else, then I'm going to be led by the client's decision making. And, you know, there's the old saw, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So I've got to decide whether or not I'm going to argue with the client who I am there, I am there to serve. And I've got to decide, is this the hill that I die on? Do I make a stand here and refuse to do it the client's way and argue and argue with them? Is this the time to do that? Is this the project? Do I have the right kind of relationship with this client to, to challenge them? Hmm, that's a tough thing. If, I, if my organization doesn't have philosophies and processes and practices articulated in place that I've got to adhere to, then it's just me arguing with them rather than me and my organization and how we want to do business. And my manager leader should have gone and talked to them about this is how we do business. No kidding. Uh, this is better and, you know, sell them on that. But clients aren't always right. And groups aren't always right. But if you assemble a project steering team um, to take ownership, because as I would joke with them, well, if we if this training stuff comes out really good and everybody's performance improved, I guess you'll get bigger bonuses at the end of the year, won't you? And everybody kind of chuckles and laughs. But that's kind of true. Because if we improve the performance of their people, their numbers are going to look better and that's got to be good for their careers and maybe financial uh, rewards. Mm -hmm. And so I work really hard to get a project steering team assembled so that I could work with them and their collective intelligence. Because I've had clients who've said, well, I think we need to do this. And they all would reject that. They have different insights. Sometimes my client is a person in the training organization and they don't know about business operations and what is smart and what's stupid. They don't know, but they've got good, they've got ideas and they feel they need to add value and contribute. And if I didn't have the backstop of real stakeholders representing the target audience's management chain, then I was going to be faced with having to answer that client who had an idea. But I've also had stakeholders who had ideas too that they thought were real smart and the rest of the stakeholders shot them down. So I always viewed my role as facilitating them getting to those decision points, having those kinds of discussion and making a collective decision, a smart business decision as to what we should do or how we should do this. Should we have group-based training face-to-face -face, or should we have group-based training virtual or should we put this in a job aid? You know, those kinds of decisions, there's all sorts of business decisions that are made in an instructional design, a learning experience design project, business decisions that have financial implications. Um, you know, we might say, oh, we like to put that in video. Well, maybe the, the, the content needs to change every six weeks. And so updating those videos is going to be really expensive. Maybe we shouldn't do that. We need to look at the life cycle cost versus the first cost. And and of course, video is easier to update nowadays with artificial intelligence, blah, blah, blah. But but so I need to be working in partnership with, and I'd rather work not with just the client, but with the project steering team. Now, guy gets to work on really cool, big, hairy projects where there's a huge things at stake, high risk, high reward. They bring in a consultant, blah, blah, blah. But when you're working inside, you sometimes can't get the client uh, to assemble a project steering team because you're working on something that's of medium risk or reward. I would question if we're working on low risk reward stuff, why are we bothering? But you know, those aren't, you don't, you don't get to decide that and challenge that, but that's just the way it is. So in that case, I would use the master performers that were given to me. Again, I don't want subject matter experts. I want master performers performing at a level of mastery the day before I met with them and get from them because that's the people I want to have as my sources for what's ideal performance, what are the gaps, what are the knowledge and skills that are required, 
Um, how would we sequence and sort the knowledge and skills into a learning path, if you will, or whatever? What do people sometimes know, but sometimes they don't? Can we modularize that so people can skip it when they already need it or they don't need it because it's not part of their job? You know, when we're making all those design decisions and of sorting and sequencing and deciding, you know, you know how what what can people skip and what can't they? Um, I want the voice of the master performers and the voice of other subject matter experts and the voice of new performers and the voices uh, of supervisors in that process so that we can make more informed decisions, design decisions and development decisions uh, as we go into things. But in reality, sometimes you're just stuck with a client and you just have to salute and go do what they uh, said. Now, Guy is a bold person. So back at Wix Lumber and at Motorola, I would tell the client, I will do exactly what you've asked for. I wouldn't do it that way myself, but I'm going to salute you. Look at me now. I'm saluting you. Yes, I've saluted you, and I'm going to march off and go do that. And they would say, well, hold on there. What do you mean you wouldn't do it? Why? What do you mean? And so then I would explain it and I would have a chance to do that, but I wouldn't challenge them and say, well, that's stupid. No, I would say, I'm going to do exactly what you've asked me to do. I wouldn't do it that way if it was up to me, but I will do what you asked because I'm here to support and serve you. And if I, and sometimes, you know, they would say, well, yeah, go ahead and go do it my way. Then it would not work out. And then we go back and do it a different way. And if I built a, a level of trust with them, when you're internal, you can do this. If you're an external consultant, you can't do this as easily unless you've got a lot of repeat business. But but this is getting to a level of trust with your clients so that they begin to trust you, so that they will listen to you, so they will consider what you've uh, suggested versus what they were already thinking. And you're not going to win all those battles. But, but so it's about that data and it's, is it valid and is it credible? Because if the client said, well, we need training on this, but a guy brings back a whole bunch of data that says knowledge and skill deficits have got nothing to do with it. You put, you continue with that L and D, you're not going to solve the problem. And isn't, aren't we trying to solve the problem when the data suggests that it's the process that needs to be fixed, that the data that the people are working with is not good data, it's old data. If we only had yesterday's data instead of last week's data, they would do much better. So the problem is not the knowledge and skills of the people. It's what the people have to work with. It's the those environmental variables. Now, if I have, if my client handpicked those master performers and those other subject matter experts, and all I am doing is collecting that and bringing it back to the client, then they've got to decide whether or not they're going to let their ego get in the way and do what they thought we should do in the first place, or that they're going to be open to looking at the data and using and following what the data tells us is the issue and what the data begins to suggest, you know, what's the solution, fix the process. Now, there've been times when clients have said, I don't own that process. I can't fix it. I guess I would agree that the process is stupid, but if we're stuck with it, what can we do? Well, then we look to the master performers. How are they performing at a level of mastery with a stupid process? And they might say, well, step three and seven, we totally ignore it. We do something different and boom. And nobody pays any attention to us because we're successful. They're not going to come back and quibble with us about that because we're performing at a level of mastery. So leveraging the top performers, the master performers, the best performers, and you're kind of benchmarking them, getting their insights into how things are done you know that's i think that's really critical and that's that leads to a lot of my success my success is due to me organizing the client and stakeholders organizing the analysis teams the people that are on it making sure i've got the right balance you know maybe maybe the master performers kind of follow the regulations but we need somebody from regulatory affairs in here because they know the regulations inside and out and they know what's coming down the pike in terms of new regulations so maybe we need to have somebody from that world in our uh, analysis team and in our design team etc sorry long answer that's all i've got as no well. i appreciate that guy uh dylan has a question for you dylan go ahead uh so what's the high turnover and low expertise index of the current workforce 
do you ever find yourself digging the records of the past to find those master performers and what they used to be able to do? Yeah, so that's uh, so sometimes they're just gone. You know, they're no longer with the organization. They 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 left. Um, mm -hmm. They they the joke is seek happiness elsewhere. Well, that's where they went. Um, so the so yeah. So sometimes I've had I, I was doing some things with uh, with Al Alcoa Alec Alcoa Laboratories in uh, in Pittsburgh, and they said, well, what if we don't have any master performers? What if the master performer is a professor professor in Scotland? I said, well, then you're going to have to go work with that professor in Scotland if that's where the expertise is. We were talking about future state performance for casting alumina ingots and doing it with gravitational forces and pouring an ingot, you know, molten metal right into the middle of air and having magnetism hold that thing as a as a like a box in air, not pouring it into a mold and and. So the the trickiness is you can only improve using this method by the mastery insights of the people that are already there. If you're trying to do future state stuff, then you bring together the best minds that can begin to articulate the future state. And it's always important to have people from the current state because a lot of the current state problems are going to be there in the future. And so to build a future uh, solution that's robust to the real world, well, what are the real world constraints and variables, the dynamics of the real world that the future state is going to have to contend with? So you bring together the best minds that you can, but you know that you're not going to be successful, uh, perfectly successful right out of the box. You're going to have to build something, implement it, see how well it works, figure out what's what what issues uh, you now have and work for solving those things. So it's a little it's a longer process. It's more costly, but you're inventing a future. Um, if you have so much turnover in the ranks, say in a call center, and all your best people have gone on, well, if they're if they've gone into management positions or other places in the company, you need to kind of corral them back to to help us improve the the performance of the people there in the current state. And that's just, you know, so where are they? And if there are none, well, then it's more guesswork. But you can still focus on, so when you're doing this job, what are we trying to produce? What is the product to be produced, the deliverable to be produced, or the service to be rendered? How do we know good ones from bad ones? What are the earmarks of those things? And then we can begin to systematically derive what are the enabling knowledge and skills? What are the laws you got to contend with? What are the policies you got to contend with? What are the internal and external organizations? What tools and equipment, materials? You know, you can ask all these questions using these kinds of categories that I use in knowledge and skill analysis to figure out what do you got to know to be able to do. But you, you know, you got to begin with the end in mind. You don't begin with the middle in mind. You don't go, hey, what are the future skills we've got to list here? And let's go from there. Future skills com <laughs> compared to what? Uh, Tom Gilbert, who's famous for, in he's got a book from 1978 on human competence. And he in the book, he talks about the cult of behaviors and how that was a huge mistake. Bob Mager talked about this in a 1970 book as well. We were too often focused on behaviors in isolation. We didn't understand that behaviors are a means to the ends. You, you employ behaviors to produce something, render a service, produce a product. What are those? What's that terminal output, the product, the accomplishment that we're trying to generate? And then the behaviors make sense within that context. But if we look at things in isolation, topics, competencies, behaviors, skills, that's we're, we're defaulting to education on those things. We're not doing training, which is how to apply that educational stuff in a specific work process, workflow, work stream. That help? But Guy, I want to argue that someone who's entering the domain, when you're looking at all of these things, it can get overwhelming. 
right? So what is your advice for people who are entering and they're looking at these whole host of variables and some of them need to be terribly nuanced? How do you navigate that? Uh, well, I, I've kind of laid this out in some of my books. I've got a book uh, titled Lean ISD from 99 that's available as a free PDF on my uh, website. Um, it lays out, you know, my six phases uh, for, you know, the Addy, my my adaptation of Addy. But it's really all about this data. So if it's overwhelming, then that just means you need to be a little bit more careful about this because can you just skip not knowing what the output is or what some of those tasks are? So, it, you know, and it, the, the overwhelmingness, the complexity of your task as a learning experience designer reflects the complexity of the work that you're trying to help people master. Now, it's much, and this is why in our world, a lot of stuff is educational. We produce micro learning. There's no practice, no feedback. It doesn't tell you how to apply it. It's just something that you need to know. And then we leave it up to the learner to figure out informally trial and error or social learning to figure out how to apply that in their world of work. Um, and we do a disservice in my view. I mean, I've got this performance orientation from Gary Rumler and all the other gurus from way back when. I'm focused on performance, knowledge and skills, uh, competencies, behaviors are a means to the end. What do we have clarity about the end? And if we too often are in our field, we're doing one size fits all. Oh, uh, address this topic here and give it to everybody. That's cheaper to do. So it may ultimately be effective once everybody figures out how to apply that, which wasn't covered but it's certainly not efficient. So too often, I think in our world, we trade off effectiveness for efficiency because doing one size fits all content deployment, that's way cheap. So we can give that to everybody. So that was efficient, but at the cost of really any effectiveness. So if you, so you are in, gonna be in an organization where they have philosophies, processes, and practices, or a lack thereof. And you're going to have to try to operate in that. And that could be advantageous because you can then go do things your way. Um, I, I would joke that that's, it's like being in an artist colony. Everybody's doing their own thing their own way. Uh, it's not predictable in terms of how long is that going to take? What's it going to cost us? versus an engineering approach to instruction or training or learning, where we have a process where we know what data we need. Most analysis paralysis is a result of people not knowing what data do I need now for my next steps. So figure, starting with the performance is the place to start in my, what are we what are we trying to help people learn how to produce they're not on the payroll to know stuff they're not on the payroll to do tasks they're on the payroll to perform tasks to produce outputs that meet all the stakeholder requirements and so beginning with the outputs of performance and then figuring out what are the tasks and then figuring out what are the knowledge and skill requirements is the place to start Let me go on here. We're getting close here to the end here. Let me just say, so this is the application exercise I was going to give everybody. So I wanted you to pick a job that you've had in the past. Usually kid jobs are much more simple than, you know, jobs we've had since, you know, we got older. Um, and, and it might have been, you know, I worked at an ice cream store and one of my areas of performance was, you know, cleaning the store or or, you know, dipping, creating ice cream products for customers or whatever. But identify an output, tangible or intangible, and identify how that output is measured. So I'd like you to each to, to spend a little time thinking about a, a job that you've had in the past. You know, maybe you weren't a master performer, but it was a job you've experienced. You know, what what of this data can you produce here in the next couple of minutes? You know, what did you produce? What were the tasks that you have to perform? Where were was were the, was doing any of that tricky? Were there uh, typical gaps where 
you know, you, you served the ice cream and it had too many sprinkles on it. And so you had to redo the whole thing. Can we do that, everyone? So if you were to, you know, draw out a chart on a piece of paper, whatever, it would kind of look like my performance model. And there's the assignment over there on the right. But I just want to give you, have you give some thought to this because that would help you generate more of your questions like, you know, how do I think about measures and such? But I want it to be real, something that you already understand, some performance that you've been involved with in a previous job. All right, my clock just hit 30 after. I'm going to cover these last thing. I, you got. You should have a handout that's available to you guys. I saw it earlier. Um, I've got a bunch of websites, a bunch of resources on that. You can follow up with that. Look at that. I've got a, some free books on one of my websites. I think there's five or six books that are, that are free. Um, books that I've updated subsequently. And so I got made the older ones free. Got a bunch of YouTube videos that I produce, my books. There's uh, me doing uh, back in 2000. Uh, Tiagi had a 99 seconds on performance at the uh, ISPI conference. And so... I there this goes over the stuff twice, but it's a it's me walking through what we talked about tonight. There's the rest of this. I'll go to the final Q and A here to see what if you have any questions um, based on you playing around with this performance model kind of thing. Questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> 